59-year-old Margaret Hassan was hailed as one of Iraq's most admired and respected humanitarian figures. Leaving London for Baghdad in the early 70s, she was renowned for her dedication as an aid worker, playing a pivotal role in the delivery of leukaemia medicine to Iraqi children during the late 90s, ultimately saving the lives of hundreds. Margaret was deeply passionate about her work and helping the people of the country she had called home for the past 30 years. But all of this would come to a horrifying end when she was abducted and brutally murdered in a cold-blooded killing that was caught on tape. Almost 20 years later, her body has never been found and no one has paid the price for ending the life of this innocent woman, leaving the question what transpired in the final days of Margaret Hassan. Margaret was born in Dublin, Ireland on the 18th of April 1945. The oldest of five siblings, Margaret exhibited a caring nature from a young age and would take care of her brother and sisters, taking them to school and organising their daily routine. The family relocated to London when Margaret was four years old, and it was here, at the age of 17, that she would eventually meet her future husband, Tassin. Tassin was an Iraqi-born citizen who had come to the UK to study engineering. He and Margaret married in 1972, and that year the couple moved back to Iraq to start a new life together. Although living in an unfamiliar country, Margaret felt at home almost immediately. She had become fluent in Arabic and over the following years found her caring nature and intelligence opened the door to many work opportunities. In 1991, Margaret joined the humanitarian relief organisation Care International and in 1998 would become a crucial figure in providing medicine to treat leukaemia in Iraq's childhood cancer victims. In 2003, the country was facing extreme uncertainty as the Iraq war unfolded, beginning with the invasion by the United States-led coalition. The conflict was driven by concerns over Iraq's alleged possession of weapons of mass destruction and its perceived threat to global security. Despite diplomatic efforts and UN resolutions, the coalition launched Operation Iraqi Freedom, swiftly overthrowing Saddam Hussein's regime by April 9, 2003. However, the aftermath saw prolonged instability, insurgency and sectarian violence, leading to significant changes for Iraq and the region. Margaret publicly voiced her disapproval of the war that was resulting in thousands of deaths of the very people that she was trying to save. By 2004, Margaret had secured the position of Head of Iraqi Operations for Care and became extremely well known throughout Baghdad for her selfless and caring nature. Margaret was held in such high esteem by the people of Iraq and large crowds of people would gather whenever she was out in public to express their gratitude. By April of 2004, insurgency was gaining traction in the country due to the ongoing war and this is when its members began taking foreign hostages in order to negotiate for the withdrawal of troops in Iraq. Since then, over 200 foreigners have been taken captive, with many of them being brutally killed in a reflection of the increasingly hostile attitude. Iraqi security warned Margaret that she was a target because of her high profile and Western connections. Despite this, she remained unfazed and felt comfortable remaining in the country that she had called home for the past three decades. Little did Margaret know, her sense of security was false and she was in fact being watched. On the morning of October 19th, 2004, Margaret was being driven to work by her private chauffeur through Baghdad when she was stopped and abducted at gunpoint by an unidentified group at around 7.30am. Witnesses would describe how four armed men leapt out of two separate cars 
and forced everyone but Margaret from her vehicle before speeding off with her inside. The kidnapping caused widespread outcry within Iraq, with hundreds protesting outside CARE's offices in Baghdad, demanding her release. Iraqi political figures, such as the Shia cleric Grand Ayatollah Ali al-Sistani, also publicly condemned the kidnapping and called for Margaret's immediate release. Her whereabouts would remain a mystery, however, over the next few days, four calls would be made to Tassin, directly from Margaret's mobile. Each time, the kidnappers demanded to speak to the British authorities, but according to the family, the Foreign Office dismissed the calls as hoaxes and refused to make contact. The British government would come under fire for their handling of the case at this time, with their only advice to Tassin to be to speak with the kidnappers and quote, emphasise Margaret's Iraqiness. The 59-year-old's well-being was unknown, up until October 22nd, when a harrowing video was released. This might be my last hours. Please help me. Please, please. Beg of you, I beg of you, please. The video depicted Margaret crying and visibly exhausted, pleading that Tony Blair, the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom at that time, to withdraw British troops from Iraq. She would also state that if the demands were not met, she would face the same fate as Kenneth Bigley, who was beheaded in the country two weeks earlier. Unusually, the people holding Margaret would never identify themselves in the videos or show any form of religious banner. They would threaten to hand Margaret over to Abu Musab al-Zakawi if the UK did not comply. Also known as Sheikh of the Slaughterers, Al-Zakawi was a Jordanian-born terrorist affiliated with Al-Qaeda, who is thought to have personally beheaded Bigley, along with two other Western hostages, Eugene Armstrong and Jack Hensley, in the previous weeks. Despite his violent history, Al-Zakawi publicly stated that he would release Margaret if it could be proven that she was not conspiring against Muslims. The UK would stand by its policy not to negotiate with terrorism, and the unknown group's demands were not met. On October 27th, Margaret would appear yet again, this time looking to be in a dark room with a bright spotlight pointed at her. She held back tears as she once again addressed Tony Blair. At the time, Al Jazeera was quoted as saying they would not broadcast the whole video due to the state in which the hostage appears. Margaret was said to have become so distressed that she fainted, having the kidnappers then pouring cold water over her as she lay on the ground. Tony Blair notably remained almost silent in the British media regarding Margaret during the time she was held hostage. He would claim he was doing all he could to help, outside of direct contact with the kidnappers, but Margaret's sister Deirdre would later state that she requested a meeting with the Prime Minister to discuss the case. However, he refused, instead only offering to speak over the phone. Despite Margaret's prominence in Iraq and the interference of the Foreign Office, all efforts to save her life would prove futile. On November 16th, almost a month after her abduction, a video would be sent to Al Jazeera. This would be the last video to ever show Margaret Hassan. The video, allegedly filmed on November 8th, has never been made public, however, is described as follows. She stands in the empty room, a deplorable, terrible, pitiful sight. She is standing in that bare room, in a white blouse, a blindfold over her face, her head slightly bowed, and a man approaches her from behind, holding a pistol. He points it at her head and then squeezes the trigger. There is a click, an apparent misfire, and the man retreats to the right of the screen, and then reappears. Margaret Hassan doesn't move, although she must have heard the click.
This time, the gun fires and the woman utters a tiny sound, a kind of cry, almost a squeal of shock, and falls backwards onto the floor. The camera lingers on her. She has fallen onto a plastic sheet and she just lies there. There is no visible blood or wound. Although extremely likely, it has never been proven that the woman in the video was Margaret. Due to the quality of the video and the fact that the victim was blindfolded. Margaret's siblings and husband, however, do believe that it was their sister and wife depicted in the video. The day before the video emerged, a group of US Marines stationed in Fallujah had discovered the body of an unidentified, blonde or grey-haired woman, with her legs and arms cut off and throat slit. The body was never identified, but thought unlikely to be Margaret, who had brown hair. As a result of the kidnapping and murder, Care International made the decision to cease all operations within Iraq. This would be a huge blow to many Iraqi children, as it meant the end of Margaret's final project, in which she helped those suffering from debilitating spinal injuries. The people of Iraq would remember the woman they affectionately named Madame Margaret as a very tough lady who was frightened of nothing, even suggesting a statue should be erected in her honour. The case would show little progression until six months later when Margaret's handbag, along with her British passport and Toyota Camry licence plates, were found wrapped in yellow plastic in the bedroom of a suspect's house, 15 miles south of the city. Margaret's sister Deirdre stated that Scotland Yard promised to return these items to the family after forensic analysis, however, this was never acted upon. Deirdre would criticise the role of the Foreign Office in negotiating her sister's release, saying that ever since that terrible morning, we have been wrongly advised and badly treated. Blair has blood on his hands. Margaret's life was less important to him than his own career. He played with politics while Margaret's life was in the balance. On June 5th, 2006, an Iraqi man by the name of Mustafa Salman al Jabouri was sentenced to life imprisonment for aiding Margaret's kidnappers. However, his exact role was not made clear and he would later successfully appeal to have his sentence shortened. This move would cause a great deal of distress to the family, who said it had left them devastated and appalled. Another two years would go by, with Tassin and Margaret's siblings being no closer to discovering the location of her remains, until a break in the case that would come in late 2008. An architect from Baghdad named Ali Jassar al-Rawi, would contact the British Embassy in Baghdad, attempting to extort $1 million in return for disclosing the location of the body. Al-Rawi was believed to have been a reliable source, as he knew an undisclosed intimate detail about the kidnapping. Although he signed documents confessing to the charges against him, he went on to plead not guilty in another blow to the case, stating he was forced into signing, with beatings during questioning. Al-Rawi would state, I have nothing to do with Hassan's abduction, I did not see or talk to her. Despite the plea of not guilty, he was given a life sentence on the 2nd of June 2009 by Baghdad's criminal court for his role in the abduction and murder of Margaret Hassan. The family were overjoyed at the court's decision, however, now had to plead with Al-Rawi to disclose the location of the body so they could bring her home to Britain for a Catholic burial. On July 14th, 2010, a day before he was due for retrial, Al-Rawi was reported missing from the prison where he was held. He had been missing for a month and hadn't attended previous retrial dates raising concerns about a possible release. Al-Rawi, who was recently transferred from northern Iraq to a Baghdad jail, couldn't be located in either facility. The director of Iraq's prisoner transfer system 
informed an appeal judge that his whereabouts were unknown and it was suspected that he had escaped. On August 22nd, 2010, Iraq's Deputy Justice Minister, Bussour Ibrahim, said that he believed al-Rawi seized the opportunity of the 2009 riots inside Baghdad's central prison to leave undetected, being the only prisoner to do so. As of 2024, al-Rawi's whereabouts are still unknown. Margaret Hassan was 59 years old when she was last seen in central Baghdad on October 19, 2004. Almost 20 years later, her body has never been found. The true motive has never been discovered and no one has ever paid the price for the senseless killing of someone who saved the lives of so many. Her family continue to live in hope that one day she will be returned home to finally rest in peace. In a tribute to their sister, Margaret's siblings would say, Margaret was an extraordinary charity worker. She had tremendous compassion for her fellow man and an unfailing belief in the capacity of the human heart. She was brave. She was charitable. She was humble and hardworking. Yes, she was all of these things. But most of all, she was our big sister. She was funny. She was silly. She was always there. Margaret gave her life for the vulnerable and disadvantaged. Margaret was Irish. Margaret was English. Margaret was Iraqi. Everybody claimed Margaret. But remember, Margaret was our sister. And we will miss her more than she will ever know.